welcome back. Uh, if you're just joining us here in the AppSec Village, I hope you are ready for a fantastic talk. If you're still hanging around from the last talk, glad to have you back. This is going to be awesome. I uh, wanted to take a few minutes to thank everybody who helped to put on DEF CON this year. Um, I know this has been very challenging for people. It's challenging for us at home. It is doubly challenging to bring a great conference experience to DEF CON. And we really hope that comes through. Also take a minute to thank the AppSec Village. Um, some people have put in amazingly long hours to make this stuff happen. Um, and we want to thank them as part of that. Um, additionally, if you want to get a shirt, head over to the AppSec Village website. You can purchase your shirt there for the second uh, second incarnation of the AppSec Village. Um, so for our next talk, we've got Paula Barr and Stanislas Molvo talking to us about turning the offensive security mindset into a developer's toolbox. Hi. Hello everyone, um, thanks for joining our presentation, which is going to be today about our journey into turning offsec mindset to developers tool set. Um, this presentation, we're going to be two of them doing it, um, and it's going to be in what we can say three parts. First one is going to be about a tool that we created inside our company, uh, which is called Chop Chop, and we will come to what happened, what was the context, what was the need for it, and that we're gonna explain what happened. The second one is how did we want to like broaden our audience into like having more and more and more people using it, and especially developers. And the last part is gonna be the demo um, that we're gonna do with Stanislas, who is here just next to me, uh, and who's gonna do it. So three parts and trying to explain our journey into like how we tried at least to achieve it. Uh, and some of the mistakes, drawbacks, and things that we learned on the way. So hopefully, um, we hope that you're gonna learn something about it. All right, let's start. Um, this graph, we actually took it from CVE details. Um, and it just like shows the number of vulnerabilities and numbers of CVEs that we got um, starting from a couple of years back to basically now. Um, so we took this graph last year and we can realize that like between 2016 to 2017, the number of CVs just like doubled. Um, and this is something that we, that we can see. Every day and every week, we get like new vulnerabilities coming in. We get Oracle, Bolton, which is just like full and hundreds of vulnerabilities are inside. We also get like Bolton of Microsoft, which are just like showing up a couple of hundreds of vulnerabilities or let's say dozens of vulnerabilities each month. And this is something that's growing, obviously, and we, we're hearing a lot about this. And in the last couple of days, last couple of weeks, we got a number of vulnerabilities during the lockdown, which was just like massive and especially critical vulnerabilities. So this is something that we can, that we can feel, and this is like getting really, really big. And we, when we're taking those numbers, we realize that just by dividing it by 52, the number of weeks that we have per year, we realize we get something like 319 new vulnerabilities. And this is the number of new vulnerabilities that we get per week. And this is huge, huge for a team to just like realize that we do have to process all this information. So bear in mind that we are not affected by all those vulnerabilities at, at the time, but it really depends on your context, on our context, on the, your customer's context, and so on. But this is something, some information that needs to be digested by your teams to just realize if you're affected or not, and if you're vulnerable to it or not. And this is huge thing to actually like realize and to process, especially depending on like the, the, the size of your, of your team. And usually when we get a new vulnerability, like the MS-17010, or let's say the new vulnerability for like the DNS remote code execution on Microsoft, which happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, we usually get the management because they hear a lot about this on Twitter, on specific magazines, on specific websites, and they actually hear about like this. There's like a really big buzz around those vulnerabilities. And usually they're coming to the security team and just asking, all right, 
Are we affected by this vulnerability or this other one that we heard about? Um, and, and this is something that, well, we can understand it, obviously. And the problem with this is we get to the point where the security team is overwhelmed by the number of, of new findings that happen each day. And you get like a backlog, which is full of things that you need to process. And it turns out that the management is coming and coming and coming again to just like ask if we are vulnerable to this, to just answer to the management, to the executive and so on. So it's something to bear in mind. This is part of the context that we are in and, and why we actually had like this old tool ID um, and we started like getting this. So the context was, was based on, on this. So the problematics we had was something circa 2016 when we started having like this kind of philosophy and mindset. And the idea was we had thousands of servers and domains that had to be scanned daily. Um, we wanted to scan them to basically for statistics reason, KPI and having some like fresh data because obviously as soon as you do a penetration test or any kind of testing, we can consider the test outdated couple of hours or let's say a couple of days afterwards. So we wanted to have like fresh data all the time and daily fresh data. Um, second of all is we did not have direct access to the servers uh, in some specific situations. And this was based because the servers were materialized because uh, it was managed by other entities and a couple of other reasons that we had. So we, di we didn't have like SSH access on all the machines all the time. So this is why we needed to have like another way into assessing the security of the applications that were running. Exposed into internet, inside as well in, in the network and really we had like a really big context with this. And we can see that the situation is quite pretty similar to what we can call black box penetration testing, which means that we don't have like administration access to the server and that we need to like find other ways to qualify and to have an ID if we are vulnerable to this specific um, value. The tech landscape that we had was also unclear. Um, in 2016, 2017, there were a lot of vulnerabilities, especially with WebDAV, if you can remember, it was like quite hot, hot topic that time, uh, but also with struts, because there were a couple of critical vulnerabilities which happened in a couple of days. Um, so th this was the things where, okay, there's huge vulnerability with struts. Are we vulnerable to it? Yes, no. And can we quantify the number of servers which might be potentially vulnerable to this? And the last point, but not least, is interesting in speaking of which was like this lean security, all right? And is, is the idea of ability to perform checks every time, so again and again. So basically this kind of like loop, this lean loop that we can, that we can have where we would be able to like spot security regression. And this remembers like a cool anecdote, if we can say it this way, is with one company, quite big company, having a bug bounty program. Um, and after speaking with them, um, they actually like told us that they, they paid like some really good bounty for a specific researcher who found like remote code execution on some of the production servers. They fixed it. But unfortunately, a couple of weeks later, they redeployed the same vulnerable component and another bounty researcher found it. And they had to pay twice for the same vulnerability that they had, that they had already patched and that they already paid one researcher for it. And this is what I'm gonna call security regression. Um, when we when we taking the tech and like the developer landscape, um, unit testing is actually one of the foundation of any kind of like new development. And I think that like this specific um, mindset and security regression should definitely be something um, that we could put on our top priority just to make sure that we get, we get all those regressions as soon as possible. Um, we have everything automated right now. We do have like a lot of pipelines for our developers. Everything is going faster and faster and faster. And I think that we can, we can improve our way into this. And this is some of the reasons why we created our tools and we wanted to, to, to tackle this issue. Security regression was, was, was one of the big parts. So this was our context. Um, the needs that we had, so needs from the field, and this was again from like 2016, we had to assess 
new, new vulnerabilities, new risks coming in, and we had to do this quickly. So yeah, 2017, we had struts, we had RS, RCE, so remote code execution on Drupal, um, we had WebDAV, we had like lots, lot of, lot of things happening, obviously, and we had to process this as faster as we could, okay? So this was one thing. The other one was, we had like a small team working on this. Um, when I'm speaking of small team, it was three to four people. Uh, all of them were all security oriented, um, which, which is really important for the rest of the journey because this started introducing some bias, um, which means that we were security people working with security tools that we wrote and we were more or less like in our circle um, and in our comfort zone which means that when we started and wanted to deploy it to other population and other kind of people, developers, DevOps, it turns out that like we had some interesting gap, I would say, um, and those bias that we introduced them, that we introduced, we're gonna try to, to give you the, the mistakes and how we tackle these issues. But uh, never mind, we will come back to this later on. So we, didn't, we needed a tool which would be fast, so something where we could just say, okay, here is the new vulnerability, run it across all our perimeter and see if we get a hit. The second one was having something reliable. And when we say reliable, it's mostly interesting for the deterministic um, return, which means that if we would run the tool twice, we would make sure that if it, if it hits, it would hit again, all right? So we would have like, there, was, there, there would be like nothing like random uh, in the processing. So we would know exactly how the rules um, would be triggered and if we would run it twice, we should have the same output, obviously. Um, and the last point, but not least, would be no false positives. So it's, it's interesting because we need to find like a threshold, right? Uh, we need to have like a tool super fast, but on the other hand, we don't want any false positives, which is really hard to combine all together, right? It's, it, it, so it's two criteria, two criteria, which unfortunately don't really work together, but we think that uh, we did quite a great job and this is something that we managed to do. Um, and considering that, that a hit, chop chop hit, would be a real hit, which means that if we get something in the output, in the console output, we would have to open an incident, call someone or start doing like an immediate action, right? And not having like a lot and lot and lot information to process. So really trying to like do some kind of like sniper thing and just making sure that we get to what's really valuable. So those were our needs and yeah, trust me, we, we had a lot of them. So if we can take an image, uh, an analogy, it would be like more or less like going to the jungle, right? And it would be like something where we, we would just have like a machete and like start just like chopping trees to try to like create a path in like the, the jungle so that we could reach our destination point. Um, but this was like more or less the case. Um, as, you, as you saw beforehand, it was more or less like an approach of like black box testing where the, the tech landscape was a bit unclear. Um, we didn't exactly know what we were doing and what we wanted to do is like creating hypothesis and trying to see if it would be val valuable for our context and making sure that the tool that we, that we release and that we get would be something also valuable for other organizations so that they could customize it for their own environments. This is like mostly like the, the whole soul of the app, of the application. So yeah, this analogy, the, really the analogy of Django and having something where we would have to like start chopping trees and making sure that uh, <laughs> we're not in danger. So we were saying chop, 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 chop. And what does it mean? Um, it's actually a funny name and it's something coming from Cantonese, which means hurry and suggest to do something like without delay and right now. So we thought the name was well interesting and exactly what was like the spirit of the tool. Uh, so this is why we called it Chop Chop. We wanted to have like a tool where if an emergency alert was coming in, we would be able to like respond right now and having results in no time. So it was the, the whole soul and this is why we kept the name Chop Chop and released the tool with, with this name. The tool initially back in 2017 was written with Python. Um, we started with Python 2.7, then migrated to Python 3. We got everything working and following the upcoming month, we started getting plugins that the security team mostly 
wrote. Um, and in the end, we came up with 80 plugins. So 80 things processing which were done. Um, going from trying to find if there was like a .git folder exposed on the internet, or let's say in the web route, accessible in the web route, to also like checking if the RDP port was also open, uh, checking if the, if the port was here and was just responding. Couple of things like this, and we started like creating plugins um, which were specific to our environment. Those ones were not released, but this gives you the idea of like the flexibility of the tool. So taking a domain name or an IP and afterwards doing some processing and any kind of processing, basically. Um, so yeah, as I said, it was mostly doing things with HTTP um, and this was like the, the, the whole, the soul of the application first, but then afterwards uh, people started integrating like new protocols uh, and new modules to start interacting with other services. So we had everything running, the ability to run scans daily with what we called deterministic wizards, which was one of the things we, we were really eager to have. Um, so daily scans, basically every day, and allowed us to answer two questions. The first one would be to answer to the management, are we affected? Yes, no. And then afterwards, being able to quantify the number of servers or number of IPs which were actually affected with this specific vulnerability. All right, is it gonna be one? Is it gonna be 100? Is it gonna be dozens, hundreds, thousands? Is it gonna be all the servers at once? So it's actually quantifying the results and we were able to do this. So we would count every console output, every line we would get, and we would have like an idea of how many servers would be affected. Okay, so this, and this allowed us and this saved us like a, a lot of time. As I said, Chop Chop initially was written in Python, and this is an example of a plugin that we wrote, and this one is to try and check, ensure that the git.git .git repository, .git folder is not exposed in the web route. So what it's gonna do is quite simple. It's gonna test on port 80 and on port 443 in HTTP and HTTPS, and it's gonna check one specific path, which is gonna be .git slash config, and it's gonna check for one specific word to appear in the HTTP response. Based on this, we're gonna have a severity, which ranks from zero to 10. 10 is gonna be critical, zero is gonna be informational, quite similar to what we can find with the CVSS score, all right? Something similar. Again, this thing, um, we will talk about this later on, but we changed it um, in the new version of Chop Chop for particular reasons and because we thought that like having this specific range would be way too more, way too far and way too lot information to process. And based on the audience we wanted to reach, uh, this is something that was like a bit useless. So, but we will come back to this. We had a description ensuring that, okay, the Git repositories is not accessible um, from the web route and one fix, what we can call remediation. Uh, and it was really important for us because afterwards, after using it and using it, we started getting like people and non-security people using the results of Chop Chop. And it turns out that like some of them were lost by just like having like an Excel file or anything like this, just an output, Chop Chop output, just didn't know exactly what to do with this. So we started implementing like remediations to give some insights and some inputs so that like people could work on their own um, by just giving them like a bunch of pieces so that they could start working on like the remediation and mitigation. So this is the kind of like plugins that we had. Um, so yeah, written in Python, giving you some information. So you, do, you, you just had to like inherit from like the plugin class that we, that we had. And afterwards, it would, you would just have to override a couple of things and uh, you would be start to go. Here is some things that we managed to find um, on production systems. So for example, here we managed to get like repository access for SVN with some files wc.db, uh, which allowed us to afterwards to basically fetch anything from like the SVN repository and afterwards getting the source code and so on. So this was quite problematic. Um, we also had like things like HT password, which was not interpreted by um, the application server uh, for some reasons, uh, misconfiguration, things like this. But this is something that we managed to show. Um, and the idea was having hypotheses and trying them across like a large scope, depending on the scope you are, that you have. But this was the idea, having an hypothesis 
um, taking things maybe from the bug bounty. We were speaking about bug bounty beforehand. So just like checking like things that bug hunters are trying on, on large scopes. Uh, and you will see in the reference that there is a nice talk from James Keto, Cracking the Lens, uh, which is like some research that he did in 2017. It's something quite similar to what we tried as well. And, and, and we got inspired. So this is why it's going to be in the references. And if you, if you haven't seen like the article, uh, feel free to reach out and, and just check it out. It's absolutely awesome research. Even if it's like 2017, absolutely awesome and just gold. So feel free to, to, to get it afterwards and you will get it in, in the slides. So this was some things that we were trying. All right, maybe it's not gonna be interpreted. Well, what do we lose? Just like maybe writing a couple of lines of code and seeing if it's gonna match and if it's gonna trick some way. Fortunately for us, it tricked and we managed to like remediate it in a couple of hours. But also like internal information disclosure. So here we had like the service status page, uh, which gave us some information, nothing super critical, but still. Uh, it, it could give like URI, so basically like endpoints uh, and maybe some kind of like internal endpoints, but was also giving some ideas about like the IP address range that we were using internally. So those kind of things that like we didn't want attackers to, to have on their hands, all right? So, and, and we wanted to try this across like all our servers again and finding them. So this is the kind of things that we managed to find. Last but not least, uh, here is, for example, with the um, wildcard, um, so basically some cross-domain.xml files, which are way too permissive, okay? Way too permissive, allowing anyone to just like craft some payloads and being able to like start discussing with, with our website might be uh, afterwards like stealing some cookies, stealing some information, and we wanted to just like trig it on, on all our parameter. This is something that uh, we managed to find. One rule, doing it all. So yeah, it worked pretty well and we were really happy with this. So now what we had was hypothesis. We had a tool written by a security team used by security people and it was working. We were happy, everything was good. Um, but then afterwards we wanted to try the extra mile and the extra mile was actually a couple of extra miles. Um, and by saying this is, okay, we had our tool, internal tool, and we wanted to make it available to everyone. And what, what we mean by everyone is mostly developers, so that as soon as they, they having a tool that they could integrate into the pipeline and in the CI CD pipeline. So this was our goal and basically the, the, the polar star that we were to try to, to, to target. And it turns out that like the first issue that we found was actually based on communication Developers don't necessarily get security things. It's one of the golden rule, but same as the other way around, uh, which means that we're coming with our needs, we're coming with our ideas, with our beliefs. Um, developers come with theirs. Uh, and it turns out that we need to find a way on how to get a line. Um, we found like this, this interesting thread on Twitter, so we're not shaming anyone or doing any kind of finger pointing, but we think that like it's an interesting thing. Um, and so, so, so we got someone on Twitter basically showing and giving some, some idea f about like past experience and start using acronym. Uh, IR, especially if you're working in security, this is something which stands for incident response and this is perfectly understandable. But it turns out that like in the, comment, in the comments, we got some people where IR didn't mean anything. Um, so people started looking up and found that like it was an acronym maybe for infrared, infrared cameras. And it's something that if the, this person doesn't know the acronym, um, there's some issue with like the communication and we need to find a way into like achieving and finding a bridge between them. And the last picture um, is just showing on the right that everyone is right. Uh, everyone is right based on like what they're looking up, but it's just that we need to get those two people aligned to make sure that um, we get like a, they can move forward and they can move together in the same direction. Uh, security is not against developers, developers are not against security. I think both of them can work together. But just like trying to like get the same beliefs, uh, at least on, on some very specific topics. But so yeah, interesting things about like the communication, communication channel and speaking the same language. And when, when it comes to security, 
Uh, it comes with a lot of details. Um, SSTI, XSS, XXE, SQLI. But also, when we're speaking about CVEs, so we get like thousands of CVEs, as we saw it uh, earlier, but also like MS built-in, um, MS 08, 067, okay? But we also have like a name of vulnerabilities, Heartbleed, Eternal Blue, Blue Bone. And this is like a huge referential that we do have like in security, absolutely crazy. And the thing is, security people are actually like losing track of all this, right? Like it's so much information. We have like so much information to process. So we, yeah, we have like those like naming, named vulnerabilities, they, they have websites, they have videos, they have almost like choreography and things. But, but also like all the names of vulnerabilities and classes, vulnerability classes that we have. So much information to digest. It's already hard for security people and people working in this for day long, right? And who have been doing their careers in this. But what about developers? How can developers keep up with this information? Uh, when we just like giving them a report, some of them might just be, I'm just completely lost. I'm just completely lost. I have no idea what this means. I can see this presentation, but I might like look like a fool if I don't, uh, if I just ask the question, what is this acronym for? So it's some information that we need to, to take care of and just making sure that we get the interesting bits to developers. And there's actually another question and we're not getting to the debate, maybe uh, afterwards in the Discord, but should developers keep up with all this information? Should they? And I don't know. But I don't have the, the, the information so far. I don't know. I have my opinion, but I'm happy to discuss and to chat about this afterwards in the, in the Discord with you all. So a lot of information of process, a lot of vocabulary that we, need to, that we need to take care of, right? The second part was, all right, if we get a chop chop hit and the application is flagged because of like some reasons, maybe some plugins got in and so on, now what? Now what is going to do the, the developer? Like, I don't know, it's just tease that like there's a URL, it's giving like some information, but what is he going to do about this? What is the risk and what is the kind of remediation he can put in place to mitigate this? But he needs to understand the risk and what can happen. What, what are the bad things that can happen with this specific thing and in, in his in environment and in, in his context, right? So security vocabulary is one thing, remediation is another one. And bringing remediation in the tool and giving this capability is actually like bringing assistance to the developers, which means that we're going one step forward to them, towards them. And what's, what's going to happen is developers are going to come to us as well afterwards. And it's going to be a win-win discussion and everyone's going to be aligned against just having secure application, running production, and everyone's going to be happy with this. So bring anything valuable as soon as like you have a hit and that you have something that's actually triggering in your environment. So it could be a link to whatever, what kind of explanation. It could be like a research document, it could be anything on Twitter, it could be just a thread, whatever. Or it could be also a pointer to internal resources. Do you have like, do you use the OWASP ASVS, for example? So maybe that could be a link to the specific section and just referencing it so that developers could start getting information. Developer is super curious as security peeps. So I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to have this discussion and this conversation with them. So yeah, just bringing assistance and helping, helping them into achieving like better security within their application by giving them as much inputs as we can. Another part is contextualization. And contextualization is also key. Um, again, I'm not going to go in the debate and I think that like this is something like a question that you might have to, to, to ask yourself is should we consider the same criticity um, if we get a chop chop hit for one machine which is exposed on the internet right? and one machine which is completely air gapped in a segregating environment where only two people are reaching the application and this specific server. It might be some kind of like trade-off that you need to find, like maybe it's finding some balance. Um, because if you start answering, yes, this is exactly the same criticity, the same exploitability, uh, it might just like start giving red flags to developers because everything's gonna be critical. Um, and based on this, developers have a lot to deal with, uh, production errors, uh, they have a lot of development, they have deadlines, they have a lot of work 
that they have to do. And if we start like getting security tasks on top of it, they're gonna start getting overwhelmed and having too much information afterwards, they're not gonna be able to process any of it. So this is why I think it's a trade-off about what we try to achieve with them and what's the image that we want them to perceive from us. So balance and trade-off are now part of the game. Last but not least um, is about collaboration. And we truly believe that collaboration will empower your organization. Uh, and by saying this, is like finding the best tools to do it. Um, so for example, a lot of people when we released Chop Chop um, in June, we had a lot of people asking us, what's the difference with Nikto? Uh, and, and, and we are users of Nikto, we find it absolutely an amazing tool and it works greatly, but it works greatly especially for security oriented people um, because it's going to give you usually a lot of output, but afterwards you're gonna start to have to dig in. Uh, you might have like, between one line and the other, something which is gonna be informational and another one which is gonna be critical. But it, this is going to depend on your experience, on what you think about it, and you're gonna have to do those choices on your own. Are the developers gonna be able to do it? It might not be possible because they might not know anything about security. So this is why, this is why we want to like help them by doing some kind of like triage in all those findings and providing them like good inputs. So finding the best tools to do this is extremely important and some of them might be tailor-made. So something definitely to bear in mind. Second of all is making sure that the learning curve that you're gonna have, if, you, if you're looking for people to collaborate, which means uh, writing new rules, uh, helping, maybe doing a pull request uh, on your project and doing this kind of collaboration, make sure that the learning curve that people are going to have to start digging in the code base, that's not going to be something too crazy, okay? Um, usually, when we, when we take, when we, when we speak to developers, uh, they find the security quite mystic, okay? It's like some kind of black magic happening behind the scenes. Uh, they're using some like weird commands and so on. And this is why that if we start putting on the shelf like um, a new application that we want people to start playing with, that they start collaborating with us, uh, we need to make sure that this is mostly friendly to new people coming in security and writing tools and writing rules and so on. So something to bear in mind. And again, this depends on the context where you're in, which means if your developers are using YAML, in this case, go for it. If your users uh, stick with XML for some reasons, because in your context, this is what they use, stick with it and go for it. It's really going to depend on, on your context and and I think that the last point, discernment and clear thinking for your choices within your organization are key. This is one of the most important things that we learn is just checking the context and make sure that the security adapts perfectly to this context within your organization. Because if you're trying to, to, to get like a bigger audience and broaden um, the, the, the usage of your tools, you need to actually like get them in and by doing this, you need to like look like them so that they can start getting it um, without any issue. And last point, but not least, change the posture from no, you can't to yeah, let's see how to make it. Uh, for example, if some people want to use the tool because they also want to do some monitoring and things, yeah, why not? Why not? They should be able to do this, right? Uh, if they start asking questions about like new technology, new frameworks that they want to put in, well, obviously there's gonna be a balance into, is it something that's good for my company, for my organization? But you need to have this discussion and not having just like really close answers. So yeah, so that's, we think like some of the keys that we got um, and that we managed to see like following, the, following this development and trying to like broaden the usage of our tools. So this is why we created Go Chop Chop. And what I'm going to do is give my seat to Stanislas and he's going to present you the tool and hopefully make an awesome testing session and demo with you. Cheers. All right. Hello everyone and uh, thank you for watching this talk. I'm Stanislas Molvo. I'm working currently um, as an intern, uh, a security intern at Michelin. Um, so I present to you how um, we created GoChopChop, which is um, the second version of ChopChop uh, 
uh, which uh, that Paul presented you. So uh, Chop Chop, uh, Go Chop Chop is a command line for uh, dynamic application security testing, uh, and it's written in Golang. Uh, its purpose is to scan uh, several endpoints and expose uh, services, files, folders uh, through the web route. And um, we created the tool uh, so it can be fully f uh, configurable by developers, even uh, by non-security people. And I'll present you how uh, it works and how easy it is to modify uh, and add a role, for example. Um, all right. So uh, here we are testing our own uh, web application, uh, which is exposed on uh, port uh, 80. Right. So, um, for the purpose of uh, the demo, we exposed a git uh, config um, on the web application. So we can see here uh, for uh, we, we did a curl on uh, our on a web app, and it returns a, a status code of uh, 200 and a, a core repository format version and, and, and so on. So um, now we're gonna uh, try the tool uh, on our on web app. And so here. All right, so we launched uh, GoChopChop on our uh, URL uh, fubar.com and uh, it flagged uh, the git config um, uh, vulnerability and it gives you a severity level, uh, which is high in uh, our case, uh, a name for the plugin, and a, rem a remediation we can be used uh, later for. Uh, uh, to reduce the vulnerability. So now we're gonna see how to configure uh, Chop Chop um, to make new role and uh, how you can configure it. So no. All right. Uh, so uh, the roles are written in uh, YAML, and um, it's very easy to uh, uh, create a new one or modify. So here, for our example, we have the whole git config. So it will uh, scan the endpoint uh, slash dot git slash config. Uh, we, give, we give it a name, so git exposed, a status code of 200, which will uh, scan the HTTP response to see if the, the HTTP response gives a 200 uh, status code. Uh, match, uh, which uh, is a list of string uh, the tool needs to uh, find in the HTTP response. So in our case, we saw it was core. Uh, there is uh, a, um, other things like no match. Uh, no match is um, a list of string uh, which needs to not be in the HTTP response. And uh, another one is headers, uh, for example, content type, application, JSON. And uh, you have to give it a remediation so here we say do not deploy .git uh, folder on production servers. A quick description so the developers uh, understand what is going on and why it is uh, uh, what it has a severity uh, level of high. So here verifies that the git repository is uh, accessible from the site and a severity, severity level of high. So you can easily uh, modify it. Uh, for example, uh, high to a low level. Or for example, uh, we can give uh, if the developers don't very know what to what to do. Uh, we can give foobar, for example, and um, uh, yeah, okay. So if we launch it now, uh, it it will uh, say, okay, uh, I don't understand foobar. You need to give a severity level of uh, informational, low, medium, on high. So here uh, we can modify it again to, for example, low, all right? And if you uh, relaunch it, it will uh, take in account the modification and the severity level goes to low. All right, so now uh, we're gonna do um, a new rule. Uh, for the sake of the demo, we, um, we uh, created a quick HTML, uh, um, quick HTML page uh, with, uh, all right. So yeah, we see here we created uh, an HTML with, uh, which says DevCon rocks. So uh, I want the tool to uh, flag it 
and uh, to uh, to uh, gives us an output on uh, on this. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. So uh, here I'm gonna scan the main endpoint of the um, of the main uh, of the web application. So what we check is uh, we give a, dev, uh, a name to the rule, so devcon rule here. Uh, we need a status code of 200, and we need to match uh, my, the string devcon. So if it, if the devcon is found in the HTTP response, it will flag, and a remediation, and a description, and the severity. So we can test it. All right. And here you see the tool flagged it on the main endpoint, the severity level, and the remediation. All right, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I will, uh, uh, Paul will finish uh, this presentation and uh, thanks for listening. Welcome back. Thank you, Stanislas, for the demo. Um, so what we learned from this, so from going from a offensive mindset to creating a tool used by developers, um, and what we learned was things that finding the same language, same vocabulary, same vocabulary, and speaking of which, speaking the same, um, with the same concept is extremely important. Second of all is make sure that you get, uh, that, that they get your points and that you get theirs as well. Which means that uh, if you have some beliefs, if you have some things and reasons that, uh, that you think that like the application should be sh secured this way, uh, just make sure that you also understand like what are their problematics uh, in terms of like development side. Maybe it can be something uh, based on the organizations, but this is something that uh, has to be done definitely. That has to be done, and having you to have like a be conversational, uh, yeah, in two channels basically. Um, th third point is bringing assistance will lead to like better collaboration. So by um, as Stanislas showed you before. Uh, by giving some remediations, this could be like giving links, uh, giving like uh, information maybe yeah, to the ASVS OWASP, uh, to a bunch of resources and trying to like give the more information to the people so that they could secure it, secure it, secure it like in a timely manner. This is something that uh, bringing this will actually help them and helping them will bring like definitely more joy and they're going to be able to help you as well if you're looking for something. Um, Again, don't under underestimate collaboration tool to broaden your audience uh, based on your context. Uh, if the developers that you have that you're trying to target are using XML and you're coming with something uh, in YAML, this is not going to work. The opposite as well. Um, because everything which might be shiny or anything like this might not be the real solution and you're not going to bring anything to them. So try to bring something super valuable. This is, this is extremely important. A last point, but not least, uh, that we have on our checklist is the contextualization in trading off, the trade-off. Um, having this balance, um, as I showed you uh, before Stanislas during the presentation, you are able to change, uh, for example, the severity of one specific finding if your organization um, has a specific context. Well, for this specific um, trigger, this specific hit, especially with the git export, I would not recommend putting it in low, but this is something that we can do and that's pro programmatically everyone can do this. Even non-developers people, non-tech people. You could definitely imagine a product owner or anyone just like you have this file and you can actually start tweaking a couple of parameters. Okay, so this is something that we can do. And even though you can tweak the parameters, if anyone is just going wrong, you can see that like there are a couple of checks uh, that Stanislas developed to make sure that like to give some insights about uh, okay, it failed, but why does it fail? And okay, so it's, it's got an enum, enumeration, and you can only choose from like those specific specific values. But anyway, so those are like, I would say the lesson learned from having an offensive tool and putting it into developers' hands. We do have a couple of references and obviously we, we're just on the shoulder of giants. Um, and I think that like those specific links um, are quite valuable, and especially with the, the, the what we what we try to build and, and, and I think that those talks and those blog posts are actually similar to the to the mindset that we have. 
So first of all, and we, we talked about it with cracking the lens from James Keto, and I think it's it's interesting in terms of um, the scope he has, taking everything from like the bug bounty platforms and having a hypothesis and running it and seeing if it trigger if it triggers anything or not. The second one is the keynote from the Stick. Stick is a French conference in France, and we had the privilege to have Alex Ionescu in 2019 speaking about security with developers. Um, where he was started dealing with Rust and a bunch of things like this where he was actually like launching the debate about like should developers keep up with the compil compilation flags uh, to avoid having any kind of memory corruption errors etc and it, it's an interesting discussion I think they might have like some English subtitles because the talk is in French but definitely something that I would consider that I would consider to watch afterwards the last two is actually from Harun Mir um, and two great conferences talks. The first one, learning the wrong lessons from offense, and the second one from Besides Doha, which is make more stuff. And this was oriented to security people. Um, so those four references are absolutely awesome and we recommend you to watch them. It's, it's worth, the, worth the watch, definitely. So thanks a lot, thanks a lot for your time, thanks a lot for watching, um, feel free to check our GitHub if you want to fork the project uh, and start collaborating with this, and if we do have like one advice, embrace Akines, have fun, and yeah, collaborate with uh, your organization to make it more secure. Cheers, bye. Thank you, bye.